All right, we're, we're back live again with our uh, podcast number two, and uh, very excited to have Human Agahi with Agahi Law. And a uh, quick introduction, I've been working with Human Agahi uh, for, um, well, I guess it's been over 10 years now. Over 10 years, yes. Yeah, yeah. I actually met Human, uh, I think he was f relatively fresh out of law school. I think just a couple of years in, yeah. Yeah, maybe not even two years, yeah. Yeah. That's right. So we got him early in his career. I was able, we were able to work with him. He hadn't had any bad habits yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's go with that. But thank you. <laughs> I, I say that with a lot of laughter just because over the years, you know, in real estate, we do have a close relationship working with lawyers. And, and, um, and, it, and just like every industry, there's been lawyers that we've worked with that have, uh, haven't been great, and then there's been some that have been great, and we've worked with you now for 10 years because you guys do a great job. Thank you, thank you. So likewise, yeah, thanks for having me today. I'm really excited uh, to be the second guest on your podcast. Uh, I feel special. And yes, 10 years, it's been a long time, and it goes both ways, right? Because we work with a wide range of realtors, uh, mortgage specialists and whatnot. So the fact that we have even shared an office with each other for, for the past 10 years or even so is a sentiment to like the great working relationship we, we, we have with each other and with the trust that we have in, uh, in each other's offices and, and, you know, services, professionality and everything. Yeah, yeah. it's been great. Now, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to invite Human to this podcast today is because, um, and, I, and, and you know, these podcasts are really designed to be educational. And I hope if you're watching this that you'll, you'll stay tuned and, and watch the whole thing because I promise you, you're going to learn some things. And um, it, especially when it comes to the legal side of, of real estate, um, oftentimes people, when we first meet with them, buyers and sellers, they don't think about uh, the, the lawyer that comes at the end, right? Yeah. Um, they just know that, that at some point in the, in the transaction, they're going to have to go and sign papers with a lawyer. And I think it's a lot of times what they think. I'm just going to go and sign some documents with the yep. lawyer, right? Yep. And, and not really understanding that there is a process and there's, a, there's reasons why there's lawyers that come at the end. And, uh, and, and, it's, and you know, with real estate, you know, it's funny because there's a lot of moving parts and there's, there's, a, there's a process that starts and it goes along this process to the finish line. And again, a lot of times people don't think about how important each part of that process is. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yes, and I'll tell you this, um, we've had some very interesting scenarios over the years when you get to closing. And, and I'll, I'm gonna tell you from my perspective, Ruben, what makes a really good lawyer is someone that can actually handle some of those problems at yeah. the end, right? Of course. Yes. Yeah, somebody who actually is available can listen to you and can can help you out. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, ab absolutely, there is a process. And uh, as Rob mentioned, we generally speaking get involved towards the tail of the process. However, I always encourage uh, buyers, sellers, real estate agents to involve us even in early stages if they feel like there's something that needs that second set of eyes, something that needs to be looked at by a lawyer. We work very closely with your team. I love working with your team because they're always trying to be proactive when they need us. Because what people need to understand is that a real estate transaction, just like any other transaction, any other contract, is a contract. There are laws of contract law that applies to it. So once you sign the dotted line, you're bound by it. Right. Obviously, if both parties agree to make changes, you can change anything you want. But lots of times, one party wants to change something because it's in their favor, and the other party is saying, "No, no, uh, uh, no, we have it in writing. You agree to something else." Right. <laughs> so once you sign, don't think you can come to the lawyer and expect everything to change. Right. Because <laughs> sometimes that's just outside of the control that we have. But if we get involved in earlier stages, like lots of times, we help out realtors with drafting terms and conditions that are just different and unique to the situation. And funny, I've been seeing that more recently, like seeing contracts that were not drafted by us, but using the terms that I know are our drafts. So like we, we propose it to one person and then they use it in different transactions and it just comes full, full circle back to us. Um, anyways, yes, yeah. yeah so um, I do feel like when people are being proactive, obviously, they can 
preclude lots of issues and complications from happening. You can be, you, you can take uh, calculated measures to make sure. You can't necessarily eliminate them in every instance, but you can uh, reduce the risk. You know, the thing I find the most interesting though is that most people, and I say most people, when they, when they sign a contract, and the contract has all the language there, and by the way, the forms that we use in real estate are put out by the Alberta Real Estate Association, and these are contracts that were designed by lawyers and real estate brokers like myself that came together and came up with the right language, trying to think of most of the normal scenarios of real estate, right? Yep. And so most people are very respectful. So they sign the contract, and, and what they've agreed to, what is written in, they honor it. But there's those percentage of people that don't respect the contract. <laughs> it's like a piece of paper with some writing on it, and it's like, it doesn't matter what I signed, I'm going to decide to try to alter. And that's what you were saying, is some of these people, they want to change a bunch of things. It's like, I want to do this different, I want to do that different. And it's like, the contract is laid out very clearly, and unless both people agree to that change, it, it becomes a challenge. But it's amazing, those people that just think, well, hey, I can just adjust this. You know, that's what they want to do. Absolutely. So, so and these are, you know, and again, these are some of the things that a lot of people don't think about because you get to closing. And you might be a seller and you're thinking, okay, I'm a seller. I respect the contract. Yeah. <laughs> I signed it. <clears throat> but then the buyer doesn't want to. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, exactly. It's, and so many different scenarios can happen, right? One is that, unfortunately, and that's why it's, 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 it's very, very, very important for people to look at like a real estate transaction, like a big investment. That's what it is, right? If I want to go to a doctor, I'm not going to try to find a doctor that maybe is just closest to me. Obviously, that would be one factor, but that's not going to be the only factor. Like to me, confidence of that, uh, that doctor is more important, right? Same thing with like real estate agents, lawyers and stuff like that. It's just maybe fees, maybe the fact that your brother or sister knows this real estate agent. It just should be one factor, but it should not be the only factor because that's where we see lots of problems. People who unfortunately don't put too much time into it, get the clients to sign something. And as we've been discussing, once you sign, you're bound by it, right? Maybe if you're still within the conditional period, you can get out of it. But that just simply means the best case scenario that you've lost a lot of time and resources put on an offer that didn't go anywhere. So the point that I was trying to make is that sometimes people just sign agreements without knowing what it even means. The real estate agent that explains saying that, yeah, yeah, no, it's just the main thing is this $400,000 that you're paying for the purchase price sign here and then we'll have a deal. It's not that simple. That's why the contract is the multi-page document that it is. It doesn't have just one paragraph about your name, their name, and the property address, and, and the purchase price and potential closing date. It goes on and on because every little section impacts both parties, right? Other thing that I see is that people feel like if they go without a realtor to, to, to somebody else, they find a seller or they go to builders, right? Builders have representations, right? So they just agree on the, on the price and they sign the contract. Right? without having that professional or advisor reading this contract and explaining the pros and cons. Right? Sometimes the builders are flexible, they work with you. Sometimes they say, no, sorry, part of the deal is that you're gonna get this, we're not gonna change it. But at the same time, you still need to know what signing that contract means for you. Yeah, it's amazing, um, uh, you, you mentioned builders, it's amazing how many times people will go to a builder and sign a contract, they don't even really read it. The yeah. builder, I've, I've been there for this, by the way. Yeah. The builder representative will highlight some of the contract, yeah. the key points of it, but it's because the average person doesn't want to really sit there and read the whole thing, right? So yeah. they're like, well, you know what, I trust the builder. They've been in business for 40 years. I'm sure it's all fine. And then, again, it gets down to closing, and then maybe something goes wrong at the closing. Yeah. Now, there's no possible way in this podcast, we could talk to you about all the problems we've come across when it comes to closings, all right? Because we would be here for a long time. <laughs> yeah. But I hope you understand as you're watching this podcast that there is the things that you couldn't even possibly think could go wrong, go wrong in this business. Yeah. We deal with it every day co collectively between the broker, which is me, and the lawyer. And it's amazing behind the scenes how many of these problems 
happen, and they happen towards closing, and we're trying to get money transferred, keys released, and to the finish line. So yeah. we're gonna talk about a couple of things, though, just to give you a sense, and this is why it's so important that you hire the right people, because you have no idea what the problems can be. And, yep. and if you're a good problem solver, believe me, you'll get to the finish line, and we usually do, but if you're not a good problem solver, things can go very wrong, right? Yeah. Yep. So, real property reports. Right? You can already see Human just look at it. He, he clenched his face when he saw this because that probably How much time is, do we have? <laughs> <laughs> There's no end to that. Yeah. But, um, you know, without going, you know, on, on and on and on about it, but I mean, that is the issue we see over and over and over again, do we not? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, real property report, um, for, the, for better or for worse, is still very prevalent in Alberta, in different provinces. I. I've been told that the practices may vary, but essentially it's like a drawing for people who don't know what RPR is. That's what we refer to real property report as. RPRs, they're just a drawing done by uh, certified surveyors. They go to the land survey, the land, just, they just mark the location of the property boundary lines and the location of improvements. So permanent structures on it. I don't want to get too technical. That probably would bore a lot of people, but it's very important because it just gives the um, peace of mind to the purchaser of a, of a property that things are built within the boundaries and also in accordance with the bylaws. Because just because my property boundaries are this much and this far, doesn't mean that I can extend my, pro uh, my house all the way to the property lines. There are setback rules, there are different kind of rules and regulations. So that's the purpose of an RPR. As a buyer, you really, can't know if things are done properly or not. Maybe you're seeing a house and it has this nice, big, like extended deck that you're like, oh my God, I just can't wait to sit on the deck in the evening with my family, enjoy like some tea or coffee or something, not knowing that, yeah, it was built, but it's too close to the property line. So once the city finds out or if they find out, you're gonna be in a little bit of trouble with it. So that's what, that's the kind of assurance that the real property report provides. Now, the problem we face lots of the times is that, and that's where, again, I appreciate some of the proactivity that your agents provide is that they actually educate the clients when they're selling, saying that, hey, you remember losing that thing that your lawyer gave you when you bought this property <laughs> 10 years ago, or you bought it from a builder, they never gave it to you as an example, because that does happen. Mm -hmm. So let's order it now, because guess what? Somebody actually has to take the time to come to the land to survey it, right? Somebody has to submit it to the municipality for compliance. Again, they're trying not to get too technical, but there's a process, there's a delay, and this is in the best case scenario if there's no encroachments, if there's no issues. If there are issues, we can all appreciate how long that may take somebody to deal with the municipality um, with, with those issues. So um, the contract, a standard uh, contract that are used in Alberta mentioned that a seller has to provide an RPR to the buyer within a reasonable time before closing. In a market that things are moving fast and, you know, if the seller has lost it or they, you know, put a new fence or they just put a new deck in and they have to update the RPR, the question becomes, how do we close now? And it becomes another unnecessary complication in my mind that could have been prevented if the seller had ordered the RPR in advance, gotten it, and they've got the municipal compliance on it. So it was deliverable actually on, uh, before closing. But if it's not available, the buyers always have the option to delay closings. I've had cases that actually the, I was representing the seller. We didn't have it. I had this lovely clients, couple, they bought their property like two weeks be before and then they were selling it and we learned that they didn't have the RPR. So RPR was ordered, but it just wasn't ready on time for closing. And the buyer said, no, I'm not closing. I want to see the RPR. I want to make sure it's, there's no issues with it. And we said, okay, fine, we'll do it. Usually. Uh, the practice is that we deal with it through holdbacks. That's a big conversation topic too. I don't want to go like too long about this, but the short of it was that the, the, the transaction was delayed. And at some point the buyer's lawyer even reached out to me. I don't know what had happened, but they wanted to use this as leverage to get out of the deal. And they said, oh, the RPR is not ready. You're in breach of the contract. My client won the deposit back. You're walking away. I had to send it friendly reminder saying that, no, your client can't do this. Like we've been just delayed by a couple of days. We anticipate the RPR to be ready any day. 
Again, this is not supposed to be a legal advice session because there's lots of details that for brevity I'm, I'm obviously uh, intentionally skipping on, but um, after I had that correspondence with them, the following day they just sent me the, the money and we closed the deal. The, you know, the thing that people have to remember, and this is, this, is, this is the part where usually I have to step in oftentimes at closing when things like this go wrong, and there's a delay because of the RPR. The, the yeah. buyer doesn't want to close. Well, emotions get very high. People get very anxious. Um, yeah. You're closing on one house, maybe buying another. There's a lot of money at stake. There's a fear that, well, maybe something is going to go wrong. When you don't do this every day and you don't live in the world that we live in, that is the ang that's the anxiety. It's like, oh, well, is this buyer's money not going to come into my bank account? And I just bought another house. So you can see that people get very, very on edge when it comes Absolutely. to this, right? And this is why I keep saying you've got to solve these problems. And real property reports, there's this one example of one that, that could have been solved if it was done earlier. But what about this business of uh, getting title insurance in lieu? We hear this word in lieu of an RPR. <coughs> yeah. You know, yeah. what, are, what, are the, what are the cons with that? So title insurance, as the name suggests, it's an insurance. And if people have detailed question about what it does or doesn't do, I'll refer them to the title insurance providers because I, I don't want this to turn into something that I'm not an expert in. I'm not a title insurance expert, but it, it, ha it adds a couple of good coverage uh, to, to, to a real estate transaction, or it could add uh, some benefits. One is, and one of the selling features of title insurance by their companies, providers, is that where there's no RPR, or it can protect you against unknown encroachments, unknown issues. And that's the key word people have to remember. Any insurance, just like life, life, life insurance, disability insurance, title insurance, they're not covering you for known defects. You cannot develop a heart problem. If I go to my doctor and says, oh, man, you don't have too much to live. Your heart is gonna like, give out any day. I'm like, oh, great. I can't go and expect a life insurance company to insure me just because you know I wanna leave more money for my kids. That's not how insurance works. So unfortunately, that's a great topic and I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you for that. Sometimes we see issues that are known between the realtors and sometimes even the clients. They're like, oh yeah, there's this deck that has this problem. So don't worry about it. We'll just get title insurance for you so they deal with the issue if, if that comes up. But for, for now, get an RPR that shows some deficiencies and then we'll just supplement it with title insurance so that in the future, as the buyer, you know you're covered. That's not how it works. Title insurance companies do not generally cover you for known defects. They're for unknown defects, right? If you're buying a foreclosure property, the bank that's foreclosing on this property may not have the RPR. They don't care to go look for it. They don't care to order it. That's all part of the uh, foreclosure procedure. If proceedings in a case like that, it's absolutely advantageous to get that title insurance because you don't have an RPR. You don't know what is or could be wrong with, the, uh, with all those uh, um, structures. But in a case that you know there's a defect, please save yourself some money and don't order that title insurance. <laughs> like, honestly, because it's not doing anybody any favors. There we go. So, so in other words, you just may not be able to, uh, to file a claim that they'll, they'll accept. I and mean, some claims get denied. Absolutely. And, and, and what you're saying is if, the, if, if there was a known defect and you go to the title insurance company, because maybe it was known that the garage, well, we use an extreme case here, the garage yeah. was built in the wrong spot and then all of a sudden the, the city says, oh, you have to move your garage. That would be an extreme situation. It has but, happened. But, yeah. it, but it has happened. If, the, um, if that was already a defect that was already known, then there, there's going to be a denied claim. Yeah. So you would have maybe had peace of mind getting your title insurance, thinking, oh, everything's great. But yeah, when you go to uh, file your claim, it may not work out the way you're expecting. Absolutely. So, so that's some solid advice around that. And you can see why this real property report thing is a, uh, it's, 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 it's vast. And we're just giving you a couple of very, very small examples of all of the problems that can arise from it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're watching this video and you're thinking of selling your house and you have, you have a property that requires an RPR, and by the way, the ones that require RPR are detached, attached, and bare land condo, um, require real property reports. So there you know, now you know which ones they are. And that is for all of the province of Alberta. But interestingly enough, I do see more in Edmonton going the route of title insurance in Calgary. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting thing, but I see that all the time in lieu of an RPR. It's yeah. happening a lot in Edmonton. And, and I think a lot of it is just that they think, well, I'm saving a little bit of money. 
you know, and it's just easier. Yeah, right? it is easier for sure. And you might be saving some money personally. Again, this is not legal advice because my opinion obviously is different from, could be different from other people, but I want to know what I'm getting into. Just because I have insurance for something, it's just like me not going to a doctor and doing a checkup, saying that, saying that hey, I have life insurance, I'm okay. If I die, my kids are I'm not gonna go homeless. <laughs> no, I still want to know what's wrong with me or if everything is okay inside of my body, right? Mm -hmm. so to me, maybe I'm just more paranoid than the standard person, I don't know, but I want to know if I'm buying a property, if things are compliant, because I just don't want to get into trouble, right? Yes, there could be a title insurance company that would reimburse me for it, but that doesn't, like, exclude or remove all the unnecessary complications or issues with the municipalities and going through the emotions, because you're right, like the financial transactional side of things is one aspect, but there's lots of emotion, there's lots of energy and time that goes when you're dealing with all sorts of problems, right? So I just don't want to deal with it. That's why I prefer an RPR, but yes, is it more convenient or easier? to go down the route of Titan insurance? Absolutely, is it cheaper? It, you have to look at the purchase price. You have, you have to look at the red flags because that's how Titan insurance companies underwrite these insurance policies, right? right? And that's how they charge you for those. Just like any other insurance company, if I'm an older guy, I want to get life insurance, it's going to cost me more versus if I'm in, if I'm in my 20s and 30s, right? Same, same concept. So. For a standard transaction, you can make the argument that they are cheaper, but they're not always cheaper. We just ordered the title insurance for one of our company, for one of our clients. It was a million dollar uh, title insurance, but it just costed over a thousand dollars. So it, it, they're not necessarily cheap. Yeah, RPR could have been could have been just as cheap getting a real property report. Now, just getting towards the end of the podcast. Now we don't want to go on too long on this because uh, there's only so much you can put on these podcasts where people start to their brain starts to explode. Um, but, um, you know, getting, getting towards closing out a transaction, and, um, and again, I, I can tell you from experience, because I've been doing this for 25 years, and, and believe me, when I meet people, they don't, they don't think about things that can go wrong at the 11th hour. We, we tend to think, okay, if everybody signs the contract, we're good. <laughs> problems, are, problems are solved, everything's good. And I will say, most of the time, that is how it is. I, will, I don't want to put too much fear in people because most of the time, if people sign the contract, it actually does go fairly smooth at closing. We look at the, the RPR comes in, we look at it, the money comes in, everything, everything closes reasonably on time, but there's all kinds of other things that can, that can go wrong. We had one the other day where uh, we took possession and the seller left the property in a disastrous condition, right? Yep. And, yep. and I... We do walkthroughs, by the way. This is what's interesting. We do walkthroughs with our clients as a real estate agent, usually about 24 hours beforehand. We walk through the property, and I think for a lot of people, they misunderstand what the walkthrough is. I think for some people, uh, they, they think it's maybe another inspection, yeah. and maybe I could even just get out of this contract if, if suddenly you know, they don't like what they see. Yep. And it's not that simple, right? Absolutely not. No, no. no. Funny you mentioned that because I had a deal that the buyer actually did treat it as exactly an inspection. I was representing the seller again. The buyer put, a, uh, put an offer in, unconditional, sight unseen. They were not even from, from Alberta. So obviously we were going through the emotions. It's like literally the day before closing and then they, um, they had a walkthrough. So the purpose of the walkthrough per the contract generally speaking, is to make sure that there's no major damages or substantial damages, right? That the house still has a roof where they, when they remove the TV, there's, no, there's not a black hole behind it or something crazy like that, mm -hmm. right? But they had taken, the buyers had taken an inspector with them. Right. Walkthroughs are usually brief, right? You turn on the tap to make sure the tap is working, things like that. They had taken about three hours. They found some issues, obviously, because it's not a new building you're buying. There's nothing like in perfect condition, things are still working and fine. And then they sent us a laundry list of things that they found problematic and they wanted compensation from the seller. So the argument was like, you can't do this for the walkthrough, but there's a misunderstanding. That's why if there's one takeaway from my side, at least regarding today, is engage with professionals who know what they're doing and can give you the proper advice early because 
To me, in that situation, it's a misunderstanding between their client and their agent. I don't want to blame anybody, but something, somebody wasn't educated properly. They thought that they can treat it as, a, as an inspection. When that's not real, really the reality, maybe something is broken now, but maybe also it was broken for the last 10 years. Well, I, I, I know realtors out there that'll actually tell their client, well, we'll do the walkthrough, and if there's a problem, we'll just, get, we'll just hold back money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I've right? heard that before. Yeah, <laughs> and, they, and you know, they say that, and of course, and, we, and then they just hand that to the lawyer and say, yeah, you know what, uh, we want to hold back $10,000 because we saw these things at the, home, at, at the uh, walkthrough. Yeah. And, and, and the lawyer is going, okay, look, I'll try, yeah. I'll try, but there's no guarantee, is there? There's never any guarantee because you have to understand that there's always two sides at the very minimum to each transaction, right? There, to, each part, uh, to each contract, there are two parties. You're just half of the equation and we can never unilaterally on our own change the terms. Realtors reach out to you and say that, who man, we did a walkthrough yesterday. The garage door is, is not working, so we want $500 holdback. First of all, I'm like, that's just unreasonable. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but obviously exaggerating for the, for the effect here, but it could be unreasonable. But first of all, I'm not in a position to decide. It's between my client and the sellers. If the sellers feel like 500 for a garage door opening is reasonable, hey, who am I to say it's not? Mm -hmm. But I can't do it on my own because guess what? It's their house. They have to agree. And we we'll get into this he said, she said kind of situation lots of times, right? That's why going back to my earlier uh, point about getting your professional advisors involved at early stages so you can, for the most part, the world, the real estate is not perfect. It cannot be perfect. That's why we have a judiciary system. That's why we have the court system that's filled with people suing each other, right? Because disagreements happen, misunderstandings happen. Neither of the parties could be unreasonable or intentionally like I wanted to bring like harm to the other part, but they were of understanding of A, the other person is of understanding of B, so they never actually really saw eye to eye or they may misunderstand the terms. So, but just getting that advice in advance or preparing for the worst case scenario, knowing what could go wrong and how to prevent it for the most part, like this walkthroughs, um, I think that's, uh, well, you know, that's a big part of it. My experience has been this, um, and it's kind of sad to say this, but I think it's true. Uh, out of all the years I've been doing this, a lot, a high percentage of both real estate agents and lawyers are not very good negotiators. <laughs> it's kind of sad but true. And, and, because, and I see it because you, know, you, you, know, you, you can really tell who's a good negotiator when something goes wrong because you're right, we have a judicial system but nobody wants to go there, right? No. Like that's always last resort. We don't want to have to go to court. What we want to do is solve the problem. Yep. And sometimes, yes, some, some person's being a little unreasonable. They're asking for something that might be a little bit um, over the top on their request, especially at closing. And so you got to be able to negotiate that and try to work within and, and, and come to some kind of a resolution. Yep. And that is the part where, I, if you're watching this video now, this is the message. This is the big takeaway, okay? Why it's so important to work with a good agent and a good lawyer that actually can know how to negotiate these issues because we're just giving you a snapshot yep. of a few things that happen but again it's our part to say yeah the buyer wants ten thousand dollars off and you get this you get a phone call going i want ten thousand dollars off and you know the seller is never going to agree to this right we have to kind of find a resolution here because at the end of the day we want the buyer to close we don't want to have to go to court we yep. don't want to have to have this thing drag on a little longer, not close on time. The seller's buying, has bought another property. Yep. So we're trying to work within an unreasonable request, but still manage to close this deal out, right? And this is where the lawyer and the real estate agent have to work together. And I don't know that a lot of people understand just what goes on behind the scenes yep. to make these things happen, right? Absolutely. So, so that's why the takeaway is the negotiation is a big part of this business. But I will say, um, you know, working with you guys at Agahi Law, that's one of the reasons I've enjoyed working with you all these years is because you guys do go the extra mile at those closings. Thank I've you. had some lawyers that have just said, well, forget it. You know, the, con the contract says this. If, the, if, if it all falls apart, it can just go to court. <laughs> you know? yep. so, yeah. And that's how, that, and they, just don't want, they just don't want to even deal with it. They don't even want to try to do the negotiation because that takes a lot of skill and effort. To, you know, because sometimes you have to listen on the phone and the buyer's going on and on and then the seller's going on and on, right? And then you're trying to make it all come together and that's a lot of effort. Yeah. The lawyers will say, oh, yeah, just let the judge deal with it. 
<laughs> yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. That's why having a professional group around you that you trust and can work well with each other, that they know, like, they know the market, they know the law side of it, they know the business aspect of it, is very crucial. Because it's not all bunch of like parts that are very independent from each other and they don't necessarily talk. Like we work very closely with, the, with Rob's team as an example on transactions. Sometimes we have questions, we reach out to them, they're always available and vice versa. It just makes for a smoother transactions for everybody. And the smoother something goes, the less stress you guys feel when you're buying or selling, right? Ultimately, the point we are trying to make here is not to scare anybody saying that all transactions are going to be complicated, everything's going to be trouble. No. But just preparing you for that 1% chance or 5% chance that they may happen, having that right team behind you that can prep you for it and can uh, represent you to the best is very important. It's well, not just a copy and paste or sign here and you kind of get out of my office. So true. <laughs> <laughs> so true. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap up by saying this. I mean... I will tell you, after as many years as I've been doing this, and, and I've been running a brokerage since 2008, plus still representing clients, there isn't too many things that I haven't seen. Like, I've seen just about everything possible that can go wrong, even though there's still some things that do come up that I haven't seen before, yeah. you know, yeah. and it does happen. But, um, but that is what experience really brings to the table. We say hire an experienced person. It's because we've seen these things go on. So I will say, if you were to um, reach out to us with any of your questions, concerns, or you're thinking of buying and selling and you need some help and you want that kind of level of experience, believe me, you'll get that here. And, and I can tell you, um, not too often do we get to the finish line without some bumps. There's always bumps on the road but not too often do we not actually get to the finish line and the deal closes because we're pretty good at this because we've seen a lot of this before and we know how to handle it. All right? Yep, agreed. Homan, thanks for coming today. It's awesome having you. Thanks for having me. It was great. All right. Thank you. There we go.